for the week of the 5th of October 2019. Here's your Uni Blast. First up, we head outside for all the natural world has to offer. And we start with something I had never even heard of, dog night blindness. The condition happens from birth and results in perfectly normal vision during the day. But at night, in dim light, objects become extremely hard to distinguish. The condition comes from mutations in a number of genes. Now thanks to a collaboration between the University of Pennsylvania and Mie University in Japan, they have identified the genes that cause it. They use a chip that tracked 170,000 nucleotides, that's DNA for us common folk, in 12 dogs who had night blindness. Now, thanks to a collaboration between the University of Pennsylvania and Mie University in Japan, they have identified the genes that cause it. They used a chip that tracks 170,000 nucleotides, that's DNA for us common folk, in 12 dogs who had night blindness and 11 who didn't. It also helped that all dogs were closely related. The result was the LRIT3 gene was seen to have mutated in the dogs, and the team believed this truncated form of the gene caused the night blindness. One good sign from this study is that the retinas of the dogs are still fully capable, so a gene therapy should be able to be developed. What's more, this is extremely similar to the same condition as it happens in humans, so once a treatment is developed, it might be able to be adapted to us. Have you ever watched a flock of birds or a school of fish move as one? How do they know how to move? How do they carry out such incredible choreography? Well, Matt Sozna of Princeton set out to study this phenomenon called behavioural cascade. They studied a school of fish called golden shiners and how they responded to threats. They find that the whole event is started by just one individual that is responding to a perceived threat with the rest quickly following behind. A behaviour that Sozna likened to a Mexican wave at a soccer game where it started by only one person before quickly being adapted by others and spreading. Or not, and then you just spend nights awake reliving the cringe of a failed wave. Back to fish. The shiners are helped in this by bunching up tight to one another when a threat is seen, they are able to communicate much more quickly. An individual in the group doesn't necessarily need to know what's going on, Sosna added. But as long as the group itself is doing the computation, then the individual gets the benefit of being in that group and avoiding predators. Teamwork truly does make the dream work, it seems. When it gets hot, you take a drink and cool down. But... As temperatures increase and water becomes less available, what do you do when it's warm? Sadly, if you are a desert bird, like the cactus wrens, such a radical change in your environment means you are more likely to collapse and die. This was studied in depth by UC Berkeley researcher and lead author Eric Riddell, who used virtual models of birds to predict how they would cope with rising temperatures. Riddell has a background in physics, and using computer models of 50 different birds taking data from the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, they were able to create a virtual equivalent of the birds right down to how reflective their feathers were. The results were corroborated by field surveys in the Mojave Desert, which noted a downturn in a wide range of species, including the American kestrel, prairie falcon and turkey vulture as well as small insect eaters like the white-throated swift, violet-green swallow, olive-sided flycatcher, western meadowlark, and western bluebird. Now to look at the patch notes for our very own body. It's everything to do with human biology. (coughs) Every day there is a thousand million battles happening between bacteria, and all this warfare has led to the development of some incredible weapons. Well, researchers at Imperial have uncovered a molecular crossbow that bacteria used to launch a toxic arrowhead to kill others. Called the Type 6 Secretion System, or T6SS, it utilizes an enzyme at its tip called metallopeptidase that acts as scissors cutting up the other bacteria's proteins and breaks down the cell envelope between the inner and outer bacterial membranes, breaking down the cell's structural integrity. However, the researchers hope to turn this weapon to their own use and use it as a way to supercharge antibiotics like penicillin. 
where superbugs are starting to develop a resistance to them, and so continues the bacteria bellum. <coughs> now that our summer bodies are no longer needed, it's time to laugh and grow fat into the cold, cold winter. But maybe attempting to eat healthier has more to do with labels than previously thought. A study from Sanford psychologists says that labeling healthy foods and emphasizing flavor and positive experiences are more powerful than simply highlighting the benefits of healthy eating. Now, it's been a long-held personal belief of mine that people are idiots, and I am including myself in that. But this could once again be useful to us by labeling food as twisted citrus glazed carrots or ultimate char-grilled asparagus. A liar crumb, great name, found that the name matters when deciding on what food to eat. She and the other researchers followed over 140,000 decisions, about 71 dishes that had health, flavour or neutral sounding names. They also found that word choices that brought to mind our indulgent nature, like sizzling or tavern style, really helped increase dish choice. And now, I just want some barbecue roasted broccoli. <coughs> the golden ratio has captivated scientists, mathematicians, artists, mystics, and members of any field you could probably name. But now, John Hopkins neurosurgery have found that it is baked into our very bones. Raphael Tamargo, professor of neurosurgery, found that our skulls follow the golden ratio more so than other mammals. Professor Tamargo looked at 100 human skulls using data taken from CAT scans and 70 skulls from six different mammals from the Smithsonian collection. He found that with increasing species sophistication, the golden ratio increased as well. It is hoped that this data will be useful for anthropological and evolutionary study. Now the paper goes into a lot of deep neurological details that I am just not equipped to talk about. But if you are interested, it is linked below, like all of the news stories. So please, read it if it has caught your attention. Now to look at all that's new in physics and engineering. 3D printing is cool and all, but Carnegie Mellon has moved us into the fourth dimension with their new A-line printing system. Sadly, this isn't a Tesseract kind of deal. Instead, it's a three-dimensional structure that can assemble themselves into predetermined shapes later when applying heat. The example they provide is that of tweezers or coil springs, where you just dip the 3D printed object into warm water to transform into the final shape. Even better, the equipment used was hobbyist 3D printers and used only one type of thermoplastic, so this might be coming to consumers soon. But the issue is the software, as the plastic used polylytic acid or PLA shrinks along the direction it is printed. Carnegie Mellon highlights that this is great news for those who want to ship complex structures through flat pack means, such as chair frames or sculptures. But Lining Yao, one of the researchers, is hoping to push it further, potentially replacing the PLA with an electrically responsive hydrogel, which surgeons could use to transform a simple line into the human body to a tool to be used with minimal issues. You know when you've laid out all your atomically thin sheets, but to your horror, you discover corrosion on them? I'm sure we can all sympathise. These materials hold great promise for optics and electronics, but can very easily become compromised by something even as simple as oxygen or water, so protecting them has been difficult. Often, it results in toxic, expensive, or permanent coverings. This is where MIT came in and created an ultra-thin protective layer made up of compounds called linear alkalamides that should improve upon those issues. This material covering is only one nanometer thin, but that's a billionth of a meter. And when heated, it cures cracks that form in the covering, creating a continuous layer. It is also impervious to liquids and oxygen and can even be removed if need be. Even the application procedure is simple, as MIT graduate student Kong Su notes. You just put the wafer into the liquid chemical and let it be heated. Basically, that's it. This will hopefully help these 2D materials grow throughout industries and help create easier to use materials for optics and electronics. From one tiny world to another, Harvard has created optical tweezers so they can manipulate ultra-cold molecules. The issue of handling these materials is that being ultra-cold, 
any addition of energy would result in it moving faster. Therefore, the tweezers are a very tightly focused laser that the molecules fall into and continue to be cooled. By using five of these beam tweezers, researchers John Doyle and Kang Kuen Ni were able to hold five separate molecules and control where they went precisely. Ni noted the problems that this sort of work entails, as molecules have a number of degrees of freedom. They have electronic and spin states, they have vibration, they have rotation, with each molecule having its own features. The long-term hope is to be able to use this technique to help build quantum computers, but Doyle hopes for more from it. He notes that this is a new tool to experiment with, and looks forward to physicists to come along and try hitting two molecules together and seeing what happens. It sounds like a basic question, but so far it was untestable. He questions, do they form a reaction? Do they bounce off each other? Well, if I hear any more, I'll report it. Now a look at the past and at ourselves, its history and sociology. And first up, the University of Edinburgh has purchased a very special collection of books. Previously owned by Sir Charles Lyell, a mentor to Charles Darwin, they were purchased for almost £1 million and will now be freely available to all. Sir Charles Lyell was a Scottish geologist who helped to popularise the ideas of deep time within geology, where the geological processes that are happening now also happened the same within the past. This, of course, was extremely useful to Charles Darwin, who needed these long time frames to explain how evolution took such a long time to happen. The books also touched upon the changing climate and how it led to erosion as well as his theories on earthquakes that he extrapolated from surface features, such as faults and fissures. I hope they will scan the documents and host them online, for anyone who is unable to travel to the Arald Reiki University. Where we live has a dramatic effect on many aspects of our lives, but a new study from UCL has shown just what the impact of living in deprived neighbourhoods does to your health. The study was international, collecting data from the UK, US, Finland, Sweden, Japan and New Zealand and was collected over a period of 15 years. The result? Of the 53 studies, premature death was the most common poor health outcome for those living in a deprived neighbourhood compared to a less deprived one. This was joined by more weight gain, an increase in alcohol consumption, smoking and mental health issues such as depression and suicide. Dr. Jeevaraj from UCL noted that the next question is to look at how growing up in these environments impacts later life health. I'm guessing not well, but by how much? I don't know, but I hope they keep up the good work. I'll get this one wrong right off the bat, but Pieter Brungel, the elder, was the Dutch painter during the Renaissance period, and his art was incredibly influential, helping to set off the Dutch golden period. And now KU Levin is putting on a special exhibition of his work. And that's not all. Their research project Fingerprint has been used to take extremely detailed scans of the documents to be studied by art historians and connoisseurs. How'd they do it? First, they took extremely high resolution pictures of the front and back down to the very fibres of the paper from multiple angles. Next, they dandered down to the Department of Electrical Engineering and borrowed their microdome. The microdome was originally used for Assyriology and taking a 3D view of cuneiform tablets. It looks like a miniature cerebro with 228 LED lights evenly spread throughout and one 28 megapixel camera that can then be used to make a 3D version. Even the slightest changes can be seen and can be filtered throughout the spectrum from infrared to ultraviolet. But they weren't done yet. Next, it was off to the Royal Institute of Cultural Heritage for a full analysis of the chemical composition. What paper was used? How was the ink made? The work was so detailed that they found the marks of an engraver who used a metal pen to trace the image. Now remember, these pieces are 450 years old. So, that's it all done, right? Nope. Next, they are off to use artificial intelligence to see if they can figure out how the original print has changed over the last four and a half centuries. They hope this could soon be the standard for how art is studied. I just hope they don't drop any. Now, before we get to the and finally, I can only say thank you for listening. If you want to see the whole intake with the research from all top 50 universities, check out the Uniblast subreddit. If this is something you'd like to see grow, please consider telling a friend about the show. 
I'm playing about with the format and style over the next few episodes, and I want your feedback on it. Links are below if you want to contact me. And finally, does your suction cups keep failing? Everything just falling to the floor? Well, now the University of Washington might just have developed the world's strongest. By studying the cling fish, which more than lives up to its name, the researchers were able to take nature's secrets and improve, creating the best suction ever. Now, this might sound a bit frivolous, but the implications of this are tremendous, as the cups could help with tagging marine animals or sensors to crafts. The team's prototype was able to hold up an 11-pound rock. It took five years of research, but making the best suction cup in the world takes dedication. And that's all for this week. I hope you have enjoyed, and apologies for anything I got wrong. Unfortunately, I'm no expert, but I hope you join me next time. Bye now.